uh, the poem was composed in July 1798, as you can see here, and uh, included rather the last moment in lyrical ballads. Okay. Of the poem, Wordsworth's note to Miss Fenwick deserves mention. What Wordsworth writes about the situation and about the time of this particular poem. He says, no poem of mine was composed under circumstances more pleasant for me to remember than this. I began it upon leaving Tintern, after crossing the Wee, that is the Wee River, and concluded it just as I saw entering Bristol <clears throat> in the evening after the ramble of four or five days with my sister. So the kind of journey that is being undertook undertaken by Wordsworth here, here you will find that uh, he has a companion with him and that is Dorothy. That is Dorothy Wordsworth, who was Wordsworth, William Wordsworth's younger sister. So here he writes that not a line of it was altered and not any part of it written down till I reached Bristol. If you try to identify what is we and uh, what is Tintern Abbey, then ultimately you will find that the Wee River actually flows through Wales and England and joins the Severn flowing into the Bristol Channel. And Tintern Abbey is situated some 10 miles above the point where the Wee River joins the Severn. This is one of the most famous ecclesiastical ruins in England. You know what is ecclesiastical? Something religious. It is situated on the right bank of the river and Wordsworth's second visit in 1798 was the occasion of the poem. So ultimately, as you can identify that the poem actually begins with the particular line, five years have passed and five summers. So it actually indicates that the first journey or the previous journey of William Wordsworth, it was in the year 1793. And now it is five years later, he is entering into Tintern Abbey again. The poem begins in this particular fashion. We will discuss on the, the particular, you know, the features of some romantic temperaments have been in work. And at the same time, we will discuss on some poetic sensibilities the Swarshwars is preparing in this particular poem. He says, Five years have passed, five summers, with the length of five long winters. So at the very beginning, at the very onset of this particular poem, you will find that the term five has been used recurrently. Five years, five summers, five long winters. Now, what happens, you know, that whenever we read this particular poem, it actually provides an impression that the Wordsworthian theory of writing poetry, where it is emotions recollected in tranquility, it actually gives us the basic impression that you have to think and rethink about your, about your experience and then in the formation of something extraordinary, the poem has been written. Now what happens, certainly, here you will find that when Wordsworth is entering into Tintern Abbey, he is visiting Tintern Abbey in 1798. And when he had visited Tintern Abbey five years before in the year 1793, in between these two journeys, there are multiple events that actually happened in England. And at the same time, so far as the temperament of the poet is concerned, we can find a drastic change is perceptible in the mind of the poet. How this particular kind of change is perceptible? What are the different types of changes that are found to be present in Wordsworth's own psyche or the poet's own psyche? How the transformation is taken place? What are the different stages of mind that Wordsworth is attaining in these five years? These will be discussed thoroughly. Okay, so this particular poem uh, with the uh, you know, going through this poem actually. So five years have passed, five summers, with the length of five long winters, he says. And again, I hear these waters 
running from the mountain streams with a soft inland murmur. Now, in the first part, actually, up to line number 22, that is from line number 1 to line number 22, you will find that somehow this is nothing but a kind of a description okay, of nature. So it is the descriptive notion that Wordsworth is working on. Therefore, the typical form of philosophical discourse, the typical form of philosophical orientation to the particular poem, the particular reference to the pantheistic philosophy that Wordsworth is working on, the kind of change within the psyche of the poet that is being worked in this particular poem, all these will be discussed in the uh, later part, obviously, okay, or maybe the from the middle part. But here you will find a descriptive orientation has been provided. Here you will find that some images have been created. Okay, it's some picturesque representation that Wordsworth is doing. He says that again I hear these waters. So each and every moment the readers will be made aware of the particular fact that it is not the first time journey that Wordsworth is committing. Rather, the speaker says that it is the second journey that I am engaged in. So therefore, each and every moment, he is actually comparing the present situation with that of the past. And ultimately, he could identify, or he can identify rather, that what are the particular kind of changes is perceptible here. He says, again, I hear these waters, the waters of the river we, and also the, the kind of fountains, you see, that's these waters rolling from the mountain springs with a soft inland murmur. So the image that has been created here, you can identify it is visual image. At the same time here, it has been auditory image altogether because the soft inland murmur, the sound of the river we that is flowing and ever flowing, okay? And then he says, he continues this particular picturesque representation. He says, once again, do I behold these steep and lofty cliffs that on a wild secluded scene impress thoughts of more deep seclusion? Now that is very significant. As I've already mentioned that whenever we read the typical Wordsworthian poetry, okay, or maybe the poems where Wordsworth is actually prefiguring some, you know, nature and natural abundance, then you will find somehow that in each and every moment, it becomes clear that somehow Wordsworth is always following the theory of pantheism. Probably you have heard of this particular term pantheism. What does it mean? The particular concept and particular construct that actually says within everything there lies God. The presence of God, the, sp the, the spiritual thinking, you see, it will make you aware, it will make you aware of the presence of the divine or divinity. It is the particular formation of divine design where you can find in each and every parcel of nature, ultimately you will envision the God or the godly benediction being present. Now it is not simply uh, the pantheistic philosophy or the basic orientation of pantheism. It is nothing new, you see. Ultimately, if you think about the Eastern philosophy, if you think about the Upanishadic philosophy, that is Upanishad in the, in the typical Eastern discourses or scriptural discourses, you will find probably that in Upanishad, there is always particular reference to the relation of the individual to the universe. And from that particular angle, it has been stated, it has been overstated or maybe repeatedly stated that, you know, God and something related to God is always present in everything. Okay. In everything, you can feel the divine presence or the presence of the divinity. You can feel the presence of God. So ultimately, God resides in everything. Whenever you will reach, you will find your presence or the presence of God in nature or maybe any particle around you. Then ultimate, ultimately, you will find that these are some are very significant regarding your spiritual awakening or something. So therefore, he says, I will come to that where at the last part of this particular text when he will discuss that I will be the worshipper of nature. Okay? Why he is worshipping nature? Because nature actually gives him the particular glimpse of spiritualism. That will be discussed in later. Okay. So he continues in this particular fashion. Once again, do I behold these steep and lofty cliffs that on a wild secluded scene 
impress thoughts of motive seclusion. Now, the particular uh, formation of the term seclusion, as you can see, it is a particular term that is taken from the paradigm of spiritualism. You know that seclusion, this particular term is always been used in the midst of congregation when you are being engaged in, the, in a kind of a prayer. Okay, when you are within a temple or you are within a, a church or cathedral, when you are engaged in, you know, the silent prayers, that particular sense, this particular situation is always being classified, is always being referred to as the term seclusion being used always to refer to that particular serenity or the particular quietness that is prevailing throughout the place. Now, what it indicates, as you can see, he says that I behold this steep and lofty cliffs, the steep and lofty cliffs of the mountain that actually indicates a kind of, you know, loneliness that indicates a kind of, you know, far from the bedding crowd kind of existence that indicates, you know, a kind of seclusion and quietness that is essential. Essential for what? Essential for your deep thinking. Essential to awaken your philosophical mind. That's why, so far as the description of nature is concerned, you will find that Watchworth is always prefiguring the kind of words, he is engaging the kind of words that are to some extent being related with the religious discourses, that are to some extent being taken from the paradigm of spiritualism. <clears throat> so he says, therefore, once again, do I behold these steep and lofty cliffs that on a wild secluded scene impress thoughts, that means these are the situation that actually impress our thoughts of more deep seclusion. So the essential quietness of nature, it provides you the quiet mindset and now you are capable of thinking about spiritualism, about the relation of the individual to the universe and connect the landscape with the quiet of the sky. So ultimately you can identify the landscape, landscape has been described in terms of seclusion. The landscape has been described in terms of the quietness. And again, he is referring to the particular formation of quietness that is present within the sky. So fundamentally, you will find that each and everything, you know, whether it is the sky, whether it is the nature, whether it is the river, whether it is mountain, everywhere the term seclusion, everywhere the term quietness is being repeatedly being mentioned or repeatedly being referred to this particular quietness is necessary okay why because it will provide you the opportunity to think deeply it will provide you the opportunity to think in terms of spiritualism in terms of philosophy in terms of your mind so that's why it says so it connects the landscape with the quiet of the sky Again, he says, the day is come when I again repose. So it is the second time, as I've just mentioned. Here it has been pointed out, the day is come when I again repose here. I will take rest here under this dark sycamore. Sycamore is a kind of a tree being mentioned here, the dark sycamore. The green scenario being incorporated, the dark green color actually. It may also refer to the shady perspectives. The shades are there. So the day is come when I again repose here under the dark sycamore and view these plots of cottage ground. So from a far distance, he can take a look to the cottage grounds there, take a look to the plots of cottage ground there. These orchard tops, which at this season with their unripe fruits are clad in one green hue and lose themselves amid groves and foxes. Now fundamentally, what is being referred to as you can identify, it is nothing but a kind of a description, true. He is referring to the plots of cottage ground. He is referring to the orchard tops. 
he is referring to the particular kind of a season where he is engaged in this particular journey okay so ultimately this is a kind of a season where it is not possible for the apple trees to be to produce the ripe and fruits in this particular orchard tops you will find that the that the fruits are also been because it is completely unripe it might be possible that somehow it is providing us a kind of a hint as milton did you know in case of lycidas Milton referred to the unripe fruits to mean the immature, you know, immature quality, the immaturity that the poet has at the time. So generally, he is referring to, as I mentioned just now, that it is nothing but a kind of a descriptive notion that is always in work. He is referring to the orchard tucks. He is considering this particular season. he is pointing out that the fruits are unripe and ultimately as though they are unripe so they are clad in one green hue now hue means color so these are the green color that they are wearing on and generally though there are you know the kind of uh, variegated forms of color being incorporated but ultimately you will find that the, the green color is being lost in midst of the green bushes or green branches so that's why it says with their unripe fruits are clad in one green hue and lose themselves amid the groves and copses so these groves and copses as you can see these are actually referring to the kind of bushes the kind of branches he again repeats the same orientation he go he continues the speaker continues once again i see these hedge rows probably you know that hedge is always used by or sometimes used by some people just for the fencing and here is the reference to the hedge rows beside the huts now here the imagination the certain kind of imagination of the poet it leads him to think it leads him to consider that once again i see these hedge rows these are not to be considered as simply the hedge rows these are hardly hedge rows rather i have to consider i have to think these are nothing but the little lines of sporty wood run wild these are the sporty wood they are running wild so a kind of personification has been implemented again he could see the pastoral farms everywhere the greenery is perceptible so therefore he says that the, these pastoral farms green to the very door and now as it is a kind of a romantic description as i mentioned earlier so ultimately you will find one of the features of romanticism is the implementation of something gothic here also you will find some gothic orientation being incorporated he says that from the bushes i could see the wreaths of smoke are climbing the wreaths of smoke the, the the smoke is coming these are sent up in silence again the matter of silence is there why because you will find that the seclusion is needed and at the same time when the smoke is sent up in silence these are coming from among the trees with some uncertain notice it might be possible he is thinking to some extent he is imagining as might seem that there might be the presence of any vagrant dwellers in the houseless woods so it might be possible that there is present any vagrant dweller okay any vagabond who in the house on wood just sitting and just burning the pyre okay and fundamentally from that particular pyre the wreaths of smoke are coming outwards it might be possible but he could envision all this he says therefore with some uncertain notice as might seem of vagrant dwellers in the household woods it can be possible 
the second possibility might be of some hermit cave the hermit okay as you know the hermit or the monk probably in any particular kind of a cave the hermit was sitting and just burning the fire burning the fire there where by his fire the hermit sits alone so that is that is obviously something gothic so up to this up to line number 22 as you can see from line number 1 to line number 22 okay here you can identify a kind of a stanza division has been incorporated you will find it is a kind of a description that no speaker or the words what is actually prefiguring the description provides us the basic description of tension abi what he is feeling at this moment the natural description the romantic description and at the same time he is the term like again the term like the repetition you know five and so these are indicating these are providing us the particular kind of an impression that it is the reenactment of the past so in this particular moment in this particular way wordsworth actually describes the particular place of tinton abbey at the very beginning okay from the next stanza onwards we will find the how important this particular visit of tinton abbey was to wordsworth in these times okay these beauties forms through a long absence have not been to me as is a landscape to a blind man's eye i have just mentioned that from this particular segmentation from this particular reference wordsworth will prefigure wordsworth will say that how important the journey to tintern abbey was okay he considers here to some extent in this particular section he is actually providing us the basic importance of this particular kind of a journey okay he says these beauteous forms so ultimately we can identify who, who are, uh, what are the beauteous forms the beauteous forms that have been discussed in the last stanza he says these beauteous forms through a long absence long absence of 5 years as you can see have not been to me as is a landscape to a blind man's eye now the blind man it can be can refer to two things one the person who is actually blind or physically blind two a person who is you know blind in terms of ignorance a person who doesn't think or cannot think a person who cannot feel a person who doesn't have any kind of emotion so this is also a blind man now what happens to you know to be a truth that a person who is physically blind to him a landscape doesn't mean anything because as he is blind it is not possible for him to envision or revision or revise to some extent the landscape you know what happens when we are engaged in a kind of a journey the kind of experience that we gather the beautiful landscapes that we see we can feel at any moment the same situation the same feeling the same emotion within our mind if it is possible that when you are in midst of various kinds of problems if you just shut your eyes and think and rethink about those days which you have passed in wonder which you have passed in mirth and jollity which you have passed in complete pleasure ultimately you will feel a kind of relaxed you see you feel refreshed so that's why a landscape or any particular experience of outing 
it can provide us a kind of you see uh, the breathing space it can provide you the oxygen it can give you peace in midst of the world of sufferings but it is not possible to a blind person because he cannot see anything he cannot feel anything from the alternative sense and here you will find that the speaker says these beauteous forms that means this landscape detail that have been described just now through a long absence of 5 years it have not been to me as is a landscape to a blind man sight so that means it was li the living presence within me okay it had a deep influence on me so that's why he says that i am not a blind man any longer i am not spiritually blind i am not physically blind either so that's why the experience that i have made 5 years before it had a deep influence on my psyche on my mind so that's why he says but you know that is actually separating from the previous one he says these beauteous forms through long absence have not been to me as is a landscape to a blind man's eye and then he says but of in lonely rooms and amid the din of towns and cities i have owed to them that means what happens you know that when watchworth is writing this particular poem you have to keep it remember you know you have to remember that in the year 1789 watchworth has you know has entered or had entered rather in the french revolution if you read about watchworth you will find that in french revolution watchworth was one activist but there was a particular kind of a change in him due to the french revolution that we have to keep it in mind ultimately when watchworth entered into the french revolution he considered he thought that this french revolution will be beneficial to everyone okay this will be beneficial to them and he also considered that this french revolution would be a bloodless one but ultimately what happened in the french revolution probably you have got from your history book okay but if you do not find anything properly then read a tale of two cities by charles dickens where you will find everything being discussed about the french revolution and its negative impacts what actually happened french revolution that is being thought by william wordsworth as a bloodless one was a complete fault you know because french revolution brought some of the people who actually led that particular movement into the position of the capitalists okay not directly but indirectly and somehow you will find a kind of power politics again reenacted and it actually caused you know multiple lives the lives of many so that's why wordsworth was very much disheartened as he was disheartened he actually returned from the path of french revolution and again uh, he entered into the field of the kind of literature that he was always thinking of but so far as wordsworth in canon of literature you will find that what wordsworth is writing before french revolution and what wordsworth is writing after french revolution the temperament the orientation suddenly got changed in case of after french revolution orientation you will find somehow wordsworth is is gradually were thinking in terms of something humanitarian more the human attributes are always in work in the wordsworthian poems specifically to the poems which are post revolution poems now what happened you know that's why uh, i'm not stating that uh, when wordsworth is entering into that particular field uh, or the fast journey has been committed before revolution rather uh, it was in 1970 93 so it is much later uh, after french revolution so therefore you will find somehow that what he actually felt at the time it was a kind of a mind that was what had at the time he could feel that its impact its uh, essence actually helped him during this time period that means during these five years and certainly that's why he says that often 
in lonely rooms when i remain lonely i get myself in lonely rooms and i mean the dean and of towns and cities the dean of towns and cities means actually it is referring to the dean and bustles of the cities so therefore it says that amid the hustle bustle amid the chaos of the cities often in my lonely rooms psychologically mentally philosophically i was always thought you know i was recurrently i thought about this particular journey how peaceful the situation was how important the journey was to me so i have owed to them in hours of weariness it was a sensation switch so the hours of weariness this is referring to the chaos of the city life and the sweet sensations these are referring to the kind of journey and experience that he would he had actually experienced so that's why he says i have owed to them in hours of weariness these were the sensations sweet the sweet sensations and then in a nutshell in a single line he expressed felt in the blood felt along the heart and passing even into my purer mind with tranquil restoration very important three lines why because i have mentioned about one of the important topics for this particular poem and that was three stages of mind a kind of transformation that is visibly operating in the psychological perspectives of a poet here you will find this will be discussed later okay in this particular poem truly but here in this particular segmentation in these three lines the hint has been provided felt in the blood number 1 felt along the heart number 2 and passing even into my purer mind can you not feel can you not identify a kind of a transcendence is being oriented it is transcending from the animalistic impulses to that of a thinking being when it is the felt in the blood it is actually referring to the animalistic impulses and when body is in work felt along the heart this is actually you know orienting the kind of feeling and emotion that you are feeling your heart is an active part and now it is transcending into the purer mind when the brain is an active form the spiritual formations are there this will be discussed in detail later in this poem so here he says that i have owed to them in hours of weariness sensation sweet felt in the blood felt along the heart and passing even into my purer mind with tranquil restoration why tranquil restoration as the three stages has been prefigured as you can identify the term tranquil is significant here as i have already mentioned that somehow we can find in this particular poem the basic essence of wordsworthian theory of poetry remember as i have already mentioned what was wordsworth was thinking about the theory of poetry poetry is the spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings that takes its origin in emotions recollected in tranquility so recollected in tranquility and tranquil restoration do you not find the kind of a semblance is being in work tranquility it is referring to a particular condition of deep seclusion again shanto samahito avastha restoration is is needed actually why because what you are facing what you are feeling these are the romantic writers these are not the neoclassic one when you are thinking in terms of the neoclassical period you will find somehow that the neoclassical poetry is always providing us the basic impetus to the reflective poems you know what is reflective poem you will write what you have seen okay but if you think about the romantics then you will find that these are not reflective poets rather these are imaginative poets 
these are not realistic orientation that you will find in the romantic literature rather the romance the kind of imagination will be in work in the book miller and the lamb by m h abrams you will find that particular differentiation he is deliberately making where the mirror is referring to the reflective notion of the neoclassicists the lamp refers to the illumination to see into the life of things you see so that particular thing is being described here because the tranquil restoration it actually provides you the opportunity of thinking of feeling of you know attaining some spiritual realm and therefore uh, interpret the signs and symbols that have been provided by nature to you in terms of the spiritual orientation only then you can feel you can feel the basic essence what is working in everything the presence of the divine design in everything the presence of you know the pantheism okay so i will come to that later in detail because this will be discussed in detail so i have owed to them in hours of weariness sweet sensations i felt in the blood i felt along the heart and passing even into my pure mind with tranquil restoration then it says feelings too of unremembered pleasure such perhaps so ultimately if you think about the unremembered pleasure probably it is not being operating in your conscious self the feelings such perhaps as a no slight or trivial influence these are all figurative languages you see that you know when you are stating something or trying to state something by negating its contrary it is called the litotes or litotes in figure of speech l i t o t e s when you will find this figurative orientation is providing you you know deliberate negation of something contrary okay when the negation becomes important it says feelings to of unremembered pleasure such perhaps as have no slight or no trivial influence so everything has something trivial everything has something slight the influence upon the human beings in general but if you think about the tranquil restoration if you think about the feelings that you are feeling within your heart in your mind the pleasures that are unremembered these actually influence the poet powerfully okay so therefore he says such perhaps as have no slight or no trivial influence on that best portion of a good man's life so certainly the question comes that what are the best portion of human uh, human life or good man's life the best portion is actually referring to not the animalistic impulses the best portion is not to be associated with your bodily enterprises the best portion is not actually indicating towards your physical orientation rather it is mind we are the thinking being so when the thought is in work when the spiritualism is in work ultimately you will find it is the best portion because if you are feeling you are you are actually thinking you know there is a there is a proverb almost there is always present where science ends philosophy begins and where philosophy ends spiritualism begins so you cannot judge spiritualism in terms of something scientific now what happens you know spiritualism has something better something better so ultimately when it is the good man's life or the best portion of good man's life ultimately wordsworth who is a philosopher here his philosophic orientation his philosophic thinking is actually indicating toward something spiritual so therefore he says such perhaps as have no slight or trivial influence on that best portion of a good man's life his little nameless unremembered acts of kindness and of love the kindness love the little nameless unremembered acts the acts of kindness and of love these are all you know unremembered things but ultimately you cannot you cannot negate its implication you cannot negate its importance in someone's life then he says okay i am negating something physical i am negating something earthly but when i am negating my that particular self 
the earthly enterprises, the physical self. Actually, I found another gift. Okay. Here, in the next section, it has been pointed out. It says, nor less I trust to them, I may have owed another gift of aspect more sublime. So when I have actually negated our physical existence, when I have actually negated our earthly orientation, I have to consider, I have to trust to the particular thought that I may have owed another gift. The gift has been provided by, by God. And what is the gift? The gift of aspect more sublime. Now, when you are thinking in terms of sublimity, it is the egoistical sublime that he is working on. It is not the, you know, when you are the kind of term, the term sublimity or sublime, it has been first oriented by Longinus, the Roman theoretician. But what's what is always working on egoistical sublime? When you are completely free from the grab of your earthly physical orientation when you can reach to the sublime orientation something transcendental that particular gift has been referred to the poet says therefore that i have been provided with another gift it is a kind of a gift that is more sublime and what is that that blessed mood the kind of mood in which the burden of the mystery Okay, in which the heavy and weary weight of all this unintelligible world is lightened. Now, there are some limitations of science. As I've just mentioned, the world remains unintelligible to you. Okay, and spiritualism can provide you the extra impetus on your mind. When a person is spiritually aware, he is completely free from the mundane orientations of the life. So the world that remains unintelligible to us, the world that remains unintelligible just because of our ignorance, just because of our avidya. Remember the term avidya that is taken from Upanishad? In Upanishad, it is being stated that we are suffering from a kind of an ignorance. We are suffering from a kind of avidya. And avidya is the sole thing that actually makes us conscious where we ought to be unconscious and unconscious where we ought to be conscious. It is completely, it's a kind of an ignorance. It's a kind of a trap. A snare created by Maya. And we are entrapped within that particular net. And this particular entrapment, it dissuades us to believe in the field of religion, in the field of spiritualism. Avidya is that thing that actually creates a kind of a bar, impediment. Okay, that's why we cannot you know, make ourselves free from the world of Maya and achieve Nirvana. These are the lines that have been written in Upanishad. Varsvartyam theory of poetry, Varsvartyam philosophy of poetry, always dealing with the same. He says that it is the unintelligible world before us. And when you are, you are well aware of that blessed mood, when you can identify the burden of the mystery, the mystery of all creation, the mystery of everything in which the heavy and weary weight of this all, all this unintelligible world is lightened. When we will be well aware of everything, when you will be very much conscious about your spiritual being, only then, the, then this particular formation of darkness will be dispersed. And it is being, the illumination will come. Okay, that is the hello, just behind the, the head of some, the persons like Gautam Buddha. So that is the thing actually being incorporated. In which the heavy and the weary weight of all this unintelligible world is lightened. It is the serene and blessed mood in which the affections gently lead us on. 
how long or when you will be aware of this particular thing when you can completely negate your body that is the typical orientation of buddhism there is a typical orientation of upanishad that only when your soul will be free only then where your soul will be powerful aware of its own existence when you can negate your physicality that particular thing has been incorporated here he says therefore until until then the breath of this corporeal frame this corporeal frame is our body and the breath and even the motion of our human blood almost suspended when the the motion of our human blood these are all referring to the physicality these are all referring to the earthly existence this is all referring to the physical world when your breath of your corporeal frame and even the motion of our human blood is almost suspended when you are laid asleep in body the body will be in a sleep situation and your soul will be living so when you can suspend your body when you can negate your body when you can negate your bodily enterprises when you can negate your earthly existence when you can negate your material self or materialism the hankering after materialism money and everything you see that we have been being ensnared at when you can negate them only then your soul will be free only then the soul will be living so that particular thing is needed you see to identify what is working within nature to identify what is working there okay and each and everywhere we have read that in our ancient texts ancient literary texts and spiritual texts that are not being present today the most of them has been vanished due to some colonial perspectives or colonial uh, uh, you know torture and something we know that today that in the formation of dhyana dhyan okay the the persons the the wise men in the ancient ages the sages they could do this okay but we cannot why because we are suffering from that avidya we are suffering from that ignorance we are suffering from the theories of empirical thoughts that actually gives us leads us to think to believe only that only those that can be felt through our five senses only we deny the presence of anything that we cannot perceive through our five senses that is the typical empirical thinking that is the typical old western thought that has been dumped on us and we are negating the basic culture we are negating the original true self of ours that was age long you see thousands and lakhs of years long okay so that's why it says when you can almost suspend them the human blood can be suspended the breath of the corporeal frame can be suspended then you will be asleep in body and you can become a living soul while with an eye that eye is not the literal eye it is the vision made quiet by the power of harmony you can feel the harmony remember the individual and the universe everything is related god resides in everything that is the pantheism so you can feel the harmony when your harmony the power of harmony is present within your mind within your thought when it which will make make your uh, will make your eyes or vision quiet only then while with an eye made quiet by the power of harmony and the deep power of joy you can feel the essence of joy you can feel the essence of harmony within you will see into the life of things so in everything you will be aware the presence of life not only the animated things but also in the inanimate you will feel the presence of the divinity you will feel the presence of the almighty in everything whether it is in the last rays of the sun whether it is in the last drop of water whether in each and every petal of a flower or maybe any particular particle or maybe in everything you will feel the presence of the almighty the presence of all pervading power you see 
so that is the realization of pantheistic philosophy the communion with the natural world that uh, wordsworth is actually prefiguring now what happens you know that uh, in case of william wordsworth's writing we can feel that uh, the function of a poet when uh, he is writing his preface to lyrical ballads we have found that uh, a, a poet is uh, that man wordsworth actually is prefiguring the function of a poet he says a poet will be that particular person who has more than usual organic sensibility he could feel the the soul of nature the soul of human being and he could just make a kind of a relation between these two fundamentally what wordsworth is doing here ultimately you will find that in this particular segmentation wordsworth is actually referring to the the theory of pantheism how pantheism works and ultimately how a person will be well aware of the presence of the divinity or divine design in work and ultimately the uh, only them when he can suspend the physical orientation the material world and something you know uh, physical only then people will be well aware of the presence of the divine design within us so that was being actually being theorized to some extent in this particular section and how this is working we will continue it in our next class okay